uh, we are here at Pontoon to hear about comic books. So, comic books, importance of authenticity. We got it all tonight. So, Nerd Night, please. Come on. One final round of applause to shut the jocks up. All right, without further ado, I give you your first presenter, Ms. Dina on the Egyptian Revolution. It's not going to be that good. Um, so did, it look, did it look nerdy enough? No? No? All right. Now then. All right. Before I start doing this, I'm going to tell you guys that uh, what's going to be on there is that I'm going to give a little bit of a background uh, about Egypt and what it used to be before the revolution. Actually, not this current revolution, the way back in the day. And then I'm going to go into the new revolution, but... Um, also, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to only put the parts where I was actively uh, in the areas where people were protesting. Uh, and I'm going to be using all my footage. So for some of you who follow the revolution, and um, uh, I've seen some events that I did not mention in the presentation. It's just because I was not present there. That's why I did not mention them. And now we can start. Uh, so the Egyptian revolution started on uh, January 25th, uh, 2011. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start in the Egyptian Revolution right after I give the background, but it lasts between the, the part between January 25th until February 11th. We'll go to the next part. So these are the things that people know about Egypt, except for the fact that we really don't walk like that. <laughs> Egypt is located in northern Africa. It has a population of 82 million people. It has two main religions, majority of Muslims and minority of Christians, and it was a monarchy until the year 52. And this was the last, well, missed it. Uh, so these are a group of military officers who overthrew the monarchy in Egypt in the year 52. They were led by General Major Mohammed Naguib, who became the first Egyptian president. He was removed from office, and then Gamal Abdel Nasser, the next president, took, uh, took over until the year 1970. Uh, Anwar Sadat took over until he was assassinated by fundamentalists who hated the fact that he signed a peace treaty with Israel. And then came Mubarak. He was the longest servant, serving president for 30 years. Uh, now, during the time of Mubarak, Egypt suffered from so many things, like poverty, gap between classes, unemployment, fake elections, bribery, banning of... Um, religious organizations and the domination of one main religious, um, one main political party. But all of that was not the main problem. The main problem was oppression, is that people are not able to speak about any of these issues. So the 25th of January is actually the, Nash, the Egyptian National Police Day. And shortly before the revolution, two police officers killed a citizen in cold blood and they were not in trial for it, so activists called through all these uh, little posters for protesting on that particular day that presents a police day. That's the 25th of January. People were mar marching to the infamous Tahrir Square where people went to protest. And they were faced with tear gas bombs, as we can see here. But also you can see people's bravery running into it until they found actually a way to uh, grab the tear gas bombs being thrown at them and throw it back at the Central Security Forces. Now, media reporting actually portrayed uh, how oppression was a huge problem in Egypt. Because as you can see here, this is how foreign media portrayed the revolution. This is how Egyptian media portrayed the revolution. They had very soothing pictures of the Nile. You can sleep looking at these pictures during the revolution. Uh, so during the, during the first three days, people said it out and loud and clear. We, we demand the removal of the regime. Many people were arrested, they were faced with tear gas bombs, with, uh, uh, they were beaten up, they were, uh, I, many, many people got injured during that day. That's the 28th of January, which was actually one of the most dangerous days all through the revolution. As you can see, people were faced with water cannons, while they were praying, by the way. But that's how the Egyptian media portrayed it. The 28th of January is important as well because they cut off internet connection and phone connections, and they set up a curfew from 6 p.m. 
until 7 a.m. the next day. Still, people were protesting. This guy is very important. This guy, he is uh, he's Egyptian, and he was the, interna he was the head of the International a Agency, um, um, uh, International Atomic Energy Agency, and he said the, the people broke the fear barrier. There's, there's no going back. That's why when there was uh, they, when they cut off everything, they were still protesting. This is the day where, people, where the military took over uh, the square as well, but that was the day that the Egyptian museum was looted and uh, uh, very, very rare antiquities were stolen. Mubarak gave us a very disappointing speech during that time uh, in which he did not acknowledge any of the demands of the people, which is the removal of the regime. He only reshuffled the government and police and central security disappeared completely from the streets once the, once the military took over uh, the Tahrir Square. Uh, and as you can see here, people kept protesting while the military was guarding the square. And Mubarak gave another speech telling people that he was not intending to run for another term. Now, this guy was 83 at the time. Running for another term is really not an option. What people were mad about is that his son was being groomed to not to run for presidency. And that's what people were really mad about. I put this to just portray that people were not for only one class. You see here ultra-conservative. You see a woman that's not very ultra-conservative. <laughs> you see babies. You see people from all classes of society. Uh, this is an article that uh, one of the state-owned uh, state um, newspapers published saying that they arrested spies and people from um, foreign nationalities protesting the square, trying to, protest, uh, trying to portray the protesters as traitors and people who really don't represent the Egyptian people. On February 11th, Mubarak stepped down because of the very difficult circumstances. Now, this might seem like a very short time, but during that time, more than 800 people got killed. More than 6,000 people were injured, many with some serious injuries like losing an eye. Um, this, uh, this, uh, this is one of the main uh, state-owned uh, state newspapers. It kept portraying the protesters as traitors all through the revolution, but the headlines that the day after Mubarak stepped down was the people removed the regime which shows how fake was the media is all through the revolution. The revolution achieved many, many important things. It broke the fear, it united people, people learned how to uh, voice their demands. There was a metro stop called Mubarak, it changed to the martyr station. And even though many people died, but people were still happy that they got these demands. And they got to see these people in prison. That's the Ministry of Interior, that's Mubarak, and that's Mubarak's sons. Uh, a new parliament was formed, and uh, the ruling party, the ruling party was dissolved, and Egypt has the first president, uh, the first civilian president since the year 52, uh, and he's actually a member of the Muslim Brotherhood Party, uh, an organization that was banned since the year four, uh, 54. And that was it. I hope that was not too boring. <laughs> Will you stay for questions? Oh, do you guys have questions? I do not know that we do questions. <laughs> Anybody have questions? Back there. Right. What actually triggered the revolution? Uh, there was this guy, his name is Khalid Saeed. He uh, got killed by two police officers. And these two, pol two police officers were not tried at all. Uh, that was only one of the reasons that triggered the revolution, but for 30 years, I would say only for the past, Mubarak ruled Egypt for, Mubarak ruled Egypt for uh, pretty well for the first 10 years, but you get in power, you're a powerful country like Egypt, you, you get high in power, and then, as, as I mentioned, people, uh, people start to suffer from poverty, unemployment, corruption, uh, Mubarak's royal family was ruling everything in the country, uh, one of his sons was either uh, is involved politically and the other one was a businessman uh, that can put his hand in any business he wants. And, you know, all of Mubarak's friends and uh, family can do anything they want. And, you know, corruption, corruption was the main reason. And not only corruption, oppression was the biggest problem that all of this was happening and nobody can say anything about it. The fact that I'm actually here answering your question 
is a big achievement. That, that's what the Egyptian people did. All right. Yeah, you guys are talking to me. <laughs> Great presentation, by the way. But uh, I want to know, are there, were there any foreign involvement to help make the revolution successful? Now, that's a very good question. So the question was, was there any foreign involvement in terms of making the revolution successful? Yeah. Egypt, one of, I would say, there are many foreigners living here in Cambodia, right? If there are protests here and you're walking around the street and during this protest, are you a protester? No, you're just you're walking around the street. You live in this country. That's exactly what happened. There were, there were thousands and thousands of foreigners living in Egypt people who have been living there for years, and they just happen to walk by, they want to witness uh, the change of the countries that they have been living, with, living in. Some of them got caught up in how much they love this country that they have been living in, that they actually start chanting with the protesters. But from what I've seen, as a person who was there, as you can see from the first day, I, I haven't seen anything, but what the, what the Egyptian media portrayed is that there are, what, one of the articles that I actually meant to include, uh, but I did not have time for it, is that they said that there are uh, foreigners trapping protesters in Tahrir Square asking them to not to leave. Which, believe you me, it's not true. I, I came and go whenever I wanted. The only people who prevented me from leaving was um, police trucks or actually the ambulances who was waiting outside to arrest protesters getting out. Uh, my name is Anna. So, do you think that is it easy to bring many people again in Egypt? Because I noticed that around a few months after the revolution, the largest uh, Facebook group administered by the Egypt grow from 2 3 million to 5 million. And then after 5 million, it goes boom, you get like talking, it goes down to, up to, down to 10,000. Right. So, do you think that easy to bring more people in it after all of this over? People are still protesting until until now. Uh, so every group, so there are some doctors who are pro, who are protesting because they're not getting paid enough. Students who are protesting because education is not good. Uh, professors who are protesting because students are protesting. Everybody's protesting right now in Asia because it's the first time in their entire lives they actually can do that. Uh, it's very easy to gather this number, but that has been mentioned. I, I want to tell you guys one thing that the media had lied about. It has been so it has been said so many times that there was about five million people in Tahrir Square. Tahrir Square cannot help five million people. That's physically impossible, unless they were standing on top of each other. That is physically not true. Tahrir Square can barely hold one million people, and then maybe the neighboring neighborhoods can hold more. Uh, but back to your questions. Yes, if Egypt had, if people have the will. Uh, they will still go now that they still have the power to go out and, you know, face whatever they can face to get their demands. Yeah, they can. What was, uh, what was the best coverage that you saw of the Egyptian revolution like, during uh, You know, that that's a tricky question, being a former journalist and all. What was the press coverage just for everyone else? Uh, the best coverage? Uh, uh. I would have to say the independent journalists, because they did not represent the views of anybody. They just represent themselves, and they were out there. They got arrested without anybody protecting them. Um, they just went for it. We done? <laughs> where, did you, where did you find those guys to read? Where did, you, where did you read the independent journalists? Like, how did you find them? As opposed to, like, some how did you find the independent journalists? They were everywhere. There was journalists all over the square. I, 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 w I started being a journalist during the revolution. But if you're not, if you're not, if you're not in Tahrir Square, how do you like find independent journalists? To how did people outside? Uh, okay. How well, could they have read? I, I, I don't really know exactly how we mean about your question. I mean, do you mean like how we meet each other, or how do you know the independent journalists in general? I was in the states. I was just reading like the New York Times and Al Jazeera. Like, how would, how would, how could I have like found independent journalists? Right, well, independent journalists like myself, like if you look my name up, I have a website. And that's how you get me, that's how you get me to work for you. That's how many people got me to, that, that's why I never had any free time in Egypt. I need to, to kill that website. Uh, so any independent journalist who wants to, to get hired by 
anybody, just put up a website and put his email, his phone number, and he just get, gets hired. And if it just happened that if you're many, many foreign journalists got, I would not say got rich, they got famous and got rich sometimes uh, out of the revolutions, not only in Egypt, but in the neighboring countries because they were in the right place at the right time. Uh, but there was but there was a couple of people here who actually lived in Egypt who know much about that more than me. What is the current sentiment of the country? What is your reading of the current sentiment right now? Uh, divided in a big way. Ah, oh, hey Tom. Hey, where did you get all those awesome photos in your presentation? Uh, where did you get all those awesome photos? I had a good camera. Actually, it's not a very good one. <laughs> But yeah, these were the, the footage from the revolution were mine, but the, obviously the pictures from the former president and the king were not mine. I was too young <laughs> by that time. I'll just leave it at too young. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tina. Thank Round of applause.